Hello. Welcome to Dog Food with Catherine Abel, telling stories about dogs that feed your mind and spirit. This is part three of Some Old White Woman, Some Old Black Dude. Gerald feels Tiny moving away, and he can do nothing. He looks down at the scene before him and has to grit his teeth not to cry. He has cried seven oceans in the past months. In the past two weeks, he has seared onto his brain the words he wants to say to Tiny. Now that he's here, facing the joy and contentment he has only experienced from his hospital bed, he cannot speak. He looks at these dogs he tried to destroy and sees before him their complete rehabilitation. Where once they were silent and hunched in filth and endless boredom, he looks now into eyes shining with intelligence warmth, and trust. He looks at their beautiful, healthy bodies and is ashamed he made no contribution to their current well-being. The feelings are overwhelming because he can see everyone now and because he knows each and every one better than he knows himself. He knows Ruger always wants to eat, that Jasmine likes being scratched behind her ears, that Harriet likes belly rubs, that Brownie will wait her turn with perfect manners, that Poof passes gas only when everyone is nearby and can smell the officious bouquet she'll proudly admit as her own. He knows that Emmett is special to Tiny, that he almost died, and if it hadn't been for her tireless loving ministrations, he would have. He knows that Petal is tired and having a difficult time bouncing back from her last forced pregnancy. What he doesn't know is, other than Emmett, which puppy is which? He knows their names as well as his own, but while he can feel everything they feel, and even at times listen to what they say to one another, he doesn't know who is who. As he feels Tiny moving farther and farther away, he looks at the companion animals in his manicured yard, the ones he chained, shocked, and ignored in the backyard of wherever he lived. He shudders when he thinks of the hovels they lived in, the lack of care he gave to these remarkable, intelligent creatures. Creatures capable of problem-solving, of coexisting without fighting, of watching out for one another and their human family. He thought this would be one of the most perfect moments of his life, his homecoming. But to his horror, what's actually happening is that he's filled to the brim with a nauseating self-revulsion as image after image flies across his mind in ultra-high definition of every second of every act of cruelty and neglect he bestowed upon these amazing beings. From a physical standpoint, the first month in the hospital was pure torture. The wounds and injuries to his body were numerous and profound. He had no explanation because he had no idea at that time how it happened, and his broken jaw, broken arm, and fingers prevented him from any type of communication. His detached right retina and the left of his face bandaged from almost being ripped off by something also prevented him from communicating with his eyes, which stayed completely bandaged for two weeks. It wasn't until later that he was fully apprised of all of the injuries he'd never be able to explain how they were received. He signs all the forms to give permission for elective plastic surgeries. They tell him when he'll likely be released, but warn him the recuperation process may take a year or two. He makes no remark as he hands the last sign form to the hospital administrator. She returns his health insurance card to the table by his bed and compliments him on the amount of coverage his policies provide. He closes his eyes and ignores her, recalling how he would brag to himself and his minions to not worry about health insurance because he had enough coverage for them all. His body is sliced and stitched and then sliced and stitched even more. He eats through a straw for weeks. He does not speak to anyone, nor does he thank anyone for their assistance, time, and care of him. They watch him wipe tears from his face and tell the doctors, for God's sake, get him on antidepressants. But the doctors shake their heads and say he has refused all medication. He will only allow the anesthesia for surgeries. One day he wakes up crying again. This time he feels no frustration or shame. He reaches for the box of tissues he keeps on his bed that cost him $250, pulls one from the box, and slowly wipes away the tears. He has experienced the birth of Petal's puppies. 
He has felt the weakness and will to survive of Emmett. He feels the relaxed state of Tiny's family, now realizing his dogs were her family. He awakens with the realization of what family means, something Tiny and the pit bulls could have taught him over and over again if only he had not held them in such hate-filled contempt. And so, he becomes a legend. The nurses, PAs, LPNs, physical therapists, nurse practitioners, doctors, and surgeons think that the silent crying is from the intense physical pain he's experiencing every second of every day. They accept his conversational absence because they believe his pain prohibits him from speaking. They don't know why he has forbidden any medication, but because it's his right, they must comply. And if the doctors say do it, what choice do they have? What they don't know, and will never know, is that Gerald is only vaguely aware of his physical discomfort. He uses all of his energy and prodigious intellect to focus and stay focused on Tiny and her family. Soon, it has become more of a habit than an effort. He sleeps and dreams Tiny's dreams. He learns the feeding schedule so that he can eat when everyone eats and fully experience the pleasure and taste of food. Month two finds him lucid and convinced of his predicament. He's no longer in denial as to the reality and depth of the old white woman's curse. He begins training himself to become more aware of Tiny and her family. The doctors are dumbfounded by the rate of his recovery. He doesn't respond to their remarks and questions because it would make no sense to them. They would never understand that the power of love is healing him. Never would they believe it for a second. So he remains silent, yet all day, every day, he wills his mind to stay with Tiny and her family. The 24 hours that make and bind a day are filled to the brim with an all-encompassing love that exists in her mysterious relationship and connection with the dogs. This love engulfs him, embraces him, and slowly but surely not only heals him, but changes him as well. It's during month three of his convalescence and recovery that Gerald begins to understand what it means to be a human being and the enormous responsibility that accompanies this realization. He feels tiny in her family, but differently now. It's not with the confusion and disbelief of the first month or the greedy mental love-grabbing he engaged in the second month. Month three finds him relaxed and thinking of the life he will now have with tiny and her family. He wants very much to be a part of what they have. He wants to be in their lives, but wonders if they can bear to voluntarily have him in theirs. Gerald is a man who, before this time, did not believe in love. He had been taught that it was a physical act that only took place when two people were naked, grunting, and rolling all over one another. How could he help but think this? It was the lie of the environment in which he was reared. Make love this way, make love that way. Now he knows that there was no love in the home of his mother. He realizes she had him so that she could have a friend. But her mother, his grandmother, crushed that idea as quickly as it arrived. As soon as his mother finished nursing him, his grandmother put her to work and supplied the drugs that would forever tether her to an ignominious existence. The question which continues to confuse him is, Why don't people love? It's much easier and a whole lot less complicated than violence or manipulation. He knows that an act of true love is one that isn't physical. It may compel one to touch or hug the one loved. The state of nudity and rolling around on one another is the farthest thing from love that ever was. For his entire life, Gerald has abstained from all physical contact, except for the violence he doled out. The love-making he grew up watching, then sold for a side income, had nothing whatsoever to do with love. It was a base act committed and sought after by creatures masquerading as humans. The only thing human about them was the shape of their forms and the appearance of their skin. Because of the so-called love-making Gerald witnessed during the course of his life, he vowed to remain celibate. He is a virgin and thinks he will remain so until he dies. He's relieved to know that he can pursue real love and learn what it means. It's as though a secret door has been opened, and miraculously, he has not only been given permission, but feels this tremendous invisible encouragement to walk through it 
and into a real life. Gerald is standing in front of the gate when he feels the intense adrenaline surge of Tiny. He uses the burst of energy and strength to quickly open the gate, lumber clumsily inside, and then close it. Leaning on the gatepost, he turns and looks for her, tries to find her slender form racing through the forest, because she is racing, racing away from him as fast as she can. Still, he looks and searches for her. He looks until he's sure he cannot glimpse her. He's turning back toward the house when Snowbell, Cotton, and Silky jump on his legs. He feels himself falling in slow motion. Petal and Ruger's solid white babies think he's coming down to play and help as much as they can to aid his descent. When he falls onto the soft grass, all of the puppies except Emmett run to lick his face, sit on his shoulders, or stand on his stomach and crotch. They're hurting him, but no dog has ever been allowed such liberties and access. He concentrates on their joy and affection rather than his discomfort. He can't get over how large they are at five months of age, even the females. For the first time in his life, he extends a hand to a dog without intending violence or cruelty. He runs his hands on any puppy that will let him. He feels their happy response to human touch. He feels their remarkably soft coats and knows they inherited that from Petal. As he pets and studies the puppies, Petal, Brownie, Jasmine, Harriet, and Poof move closer to investigate. Their tails are gently wagging. Gerald feels a dog nudge his head, then softly lick his forehead. He looks up into the steady gaze of Petal, his premier breeder. He can't even remember how many puppies he has gotten off of her. As she comes around and lies down beside him, she continues to look him in the eyes. He sees her eyes are brown with flecks of golden amber and that they are on him, filled with patience, waiting to see what he will do next. Gerald knows what he would have done in the not-too-distant past if a dog ever looked him in the eyes. Unpleasant, painful, and demeaning repercussions would have been sure to follow. But now... He lifts his left arm to invite Petal closer to him. She lies close next to him, puts her head on his shoulder, all the while looking into his eyes. I'm sorry, Petal. I'm sorry for the way I treated you, for not naming you, for using you again and again to fatten my bank account and increase my reputation among the standing of terrible men. I'm sorry, Petal. It won't happen again. Petal looks at him, slowly blinks her eyes as though she has understood every word and concept he has uttered. The truth is, she has already forgiven him. Immediately, after every injustice, every cruel and tormented act was visited upon her by Gerald, she forgave him. A being filled with love and trust has no room or understanding of anger or spite. Closing her eyes, she sighs deeply into his face and Gerald smells breath that is healthy and true. He moves his left hand to the top of her head and gently pets her. He feels calmness and contentment radiate through him, just as much as he feels the stressed, unceasing exertions of Tiny as she runs farther and farther away. As the puppies settle themselves on and around Gerald, he wonders about love. He's not a man of illusions. He knows full well that he does not love these dogs. However, he respects and admires them. He wants to share the bomb with them that Tiny does. How does one love? How is it done? What is the procedure, the protocol? What's the first step? As the sun bears down on his tired body, these thoughts and meanderings cascade through his mind. His last thought before falling asleep is that Ruger and Emmett have made no attempt to come near him. They stay away and never stop staring at him. Ruger sees only a monster and no Tiny. Tiny will never know that Gerald was apologizing to Petal over and over again. She will never know that Gerald was going to apologize to her in a clumsy, unpracticed, but sincere fashion. She will never know that Gerald was on the verge of giving her the greatest gift she never asked for 
because her brain remembers the pain he caused so vividly that her body was reacting as if it was happening all over again. She wants to scream a great loud warning to her family, but she cannot, and she could not stay and watch him do to them what he did to the others. Her feet fly across the earth as they never have before. She is strong, yet afraid, more confident, yet bereft. Tiny moves, and the wind seems to aid in her escape. She doesn't know where she's going, only that it takes every ounce of her willpower to not look back. Later, Gerald awakens and attempts to rise, but one of the fat, fine puppies steps perfectly on the sorest point of his healing, broken leg. The searing pain takes his breath away. Rather than react with a heavy hand, he holds his breath and waits until the pain is bearable. He then gently moves a gorgeous but dangerously energetic blue brindle pit bull puppy from off of his leg. He notices her dangling red heart-shaped tag reads, Lolly, and that she's looking at him with expectation. It's an expectation he will not betray. He looks back into her gaze and hopes that some of the wonder in her eyes will one day be transferred to his. He slowly rises from the ground using his cane. When he's standing, the adult females and the puppies run toward the house. He looks over and sees Ruger and Emmett staring at him. Ruger, I wouldn't want anything to do with me either. I wouldn't get near me. Emmett, you're right to trust your daddy. I had terrible, uncaring plans for him. Ruger looks at Gerald, then turns away and walks to the fence to stare at the facility. Emmett doesn't move. He continues staring at Gerald. Gerald looks at Emmett, really looks at him, not just seeing and not considering. He can see that Emmett has taken after Ruger in all ways except color. Emmett is solid, glistening black. Gerald can tell he will be huge like Ruger and have the same exorbitant musculature. And like Ruger, he's silent as a cat. The only thing he can see that he got from Petal are her sweet eyes. He hopes he got her intelligence as well. He's ashamed of himself for focusing only on strength, speed, and viciousness when breeding dogs in order to obtain a specimen like Ruger. He notices that Ruger has been neutered, and he's glad of this. He assumes Petal, Jasmine, Harriet, Poof, and Brownie have been spayed. He wonders if he'll be able to feel that too. He limps nearer to Ruger. Ruger does not look back at him. Gerald senses his distrust and total lack of fear. Gerald thinks that the lack of fear is a byproduct of constant love, affection, and care. He also thinks that love, affection, and care must be confidence builders. He feels no threat from Ruger. What will he feel once Ruger realizes that Tiny might not come back? Ruger, you're right not to trust me, to ignore me, but... But I want you to know that I'm sorry for what I did to you, and as long as you live, you will never be subjected to such ignorant treatment again. I will never harm you again, and I won't let anyone else harm you. I'm sorry for what I forced you to do. I'm sorry for the way I treated you. I'm going to do better from now on. I will learn how to do better, Ruger. Ruger continues to stare at the facility. He raises his mighty head and sniffs the air. He cannot smell tiny. Gerald swears he sees Ruger's shoulders dip a little, as if in defeat. But it's not that at all. Ruger is exhaling so that he can breathe in deeply, as deeply as he can manage, so that what he does next will be strong, forceful, and heard. Ruger lifts his chin and emits a howl of such sorrow, such longing, such beckoning, that it chills Gerald to his bones. He wishes he could comfort him, but knows now is not the time. A foundation of trust must be built, and then built upon. He limps toward the house and the dogs waiting for him on the front porch. Emmett watches him. He looks over at his father, howling as loud and as long as he can for the tiny human who does not appear. He watches the tall, limping human moving slowly toward his home. Emmett is a puppy, and curious, 
and sensing no threat, he runs after, then passes the human who will now feed and be a companion to him, the human who will take care of him. Because isn't that what humans do? Ruger has stayed by the fence for five days without moving. His eyes, mind, and body pointed toward the direction he last saw Tiny go. Gerald has left him alone. When he didn't come inside to eat the first night, he took food and water to him. Each morning, everyone went outside to do their business and to eat the food Ruger had not touched. Emmett would run to his father, smell him, lick his unmoving face, sit for a minute, then drink water from his bowl. Gerald has fully recognized and admitted to himself that he knows absolutely nothing about dogs. He'll keep his mouth shut and his hands to himself unless they ask him to touch them. He doesn't feel natural petting them without an invitation. The past five days have been spent watching dog videos and walking back and forth to the window and front porch to check on Ruger. He has ambled near him a time or two, but he feels like he's intruding. There has been no reaction or movement from Ruger. There is no profitable information online about helping a dog whose heart is broken. On the fifth day, Gerald is awakened at four o'clock with puppy licking and breathing. When he opens his eyes, Brownie puts a paw on his arm and pulls it toward her. He also smells the deliberate, pungent aroma of Poof's superpower. He hears open mouth panting from 11 dogs. The puppies go in and out of his bedroom. The adult females have never crossed the threshold. Something is wrong. When he throws back the covers and turns on the lights, he discovers everyone crowded into his bedroom and panting abnormally. Brownie continues to paw at his hand. Emmett is panting hardest of all. Gerald feels the distress from him and the adult females the most. He's sleepy and confused until Ruger. He can barely feel Ruger. He gets up as quickly as he can manage and barefoot moves toward the front door. When he opens the door, the dogs bolt through and run toward the fence. When he thinks how they could have left via the pet door but chose not to, he becomes even more concerned and quickens his pace as best he can. He jogs to the spot where Ruger has been planted for five days. Ruger is no longer there. Emmett and his siblings have begun barking and yipping excitedly by the gate. Gerald can make out the agitated white forms of Snowball, Cotton, and Silky. He wills himself to move faster, and when he's almost to the gate, he sees the collapsed form of Ruger, lying motionless on the grass. Now that Gerald has seen Ruger, the puppies quiet down and move slightly away as he bends over their sire. Gerald kneels beside him, putting one hand on his ribs and the other on his neck. Ruger is alive. For how much longer, he doesn't know. He feels the confusion and profound sadness emanating from the big dog, but he's truly shocked as he grasps the depth of his despondency. Ruger has lost the will to live. The absence of Tiny was defeating him, killing him. If Gerald had not seen and felt this tragedy firsthand, he would never have believed it. If someone had tried to describe this scene to him, he would have called him a liar and an idiot. If someone had tried to tell him that dogs worry, mourn, become depressed, he never, ever would have believed it. Yet again, he berates himself for his callousness, for his blindness, for his idiotic lack of insight, when all along, for years, the evidence of their complexity had been right in front of him. But he had chosen not to see anything because of a bone-deep selfishness that consumed his every waking moment. He knows he can't carry Ruger all the way to the house. His strength has yet to fully return. He jog runs back to the house and gets the wire mesh wagon that's underneath the carport. He's pulling it away from the house when he hears Jasmine bark sharply at him. Yes, he now knows the distinctive barks and noises of each and every companion animal. When he looks back toward her, he sees her head lower and her teeth grab one of the cushions from an elevated bed. He understands immediately. As he pulls the wagon toward Ruger, there are two soft cotton pads covering the hard wire bottom. When he's pulling Ruger back toward the house, he's interested to see and feel that everyone has calmed down. They're not only depending on him to revive their kin, 
They have full confidence in him that he can do it, that he knows all the answers. Gerald considers this as he wheels the wagon right into the middle of the kitchen. When he turns round, he sees all of the dogs surrounding the wagon in a U formation and looking up at him expectantly. I'm not going to let you down, he says to them, and the comedic truth and wonder of the moment strikes him. He has spoken more honestly to dogs in the past five days than he has spoken truth in his entire life. Is he becoming a man? or just slowly metamorphosing into the human being he was intended to be. He won't let them down. He walks to the freezer and removes the biggest cut of meat he can find. He unwraps it, and after consulting his phone for instructions, he puts it on a plate in the microwave to thaw. He brings an elevated bed into the kitchen and gently lifts an unconscious Ruger from the wagon to the bed. Ruger does not move a hair. Everyone is quietly watching him. It's 4.30 in the morning. The perfect time for a snack. He opens the cabinet doors, pulling out bags of treats, and begins generously dispensing them while feeling the weight of tremendous responsibility on his shoulders. As he feeds them the treats, he also feeds them praise. At first, it's awkward, because he has never praised anyone or anything, or even received praise himself. But as he recalls how they woke him up and communicated to him that something was perilously wrong and how they led him unerringly to the scene of peril, the praise begins to fall easily from his lips because he's genuinely amazed and impressed by their most definitely praiseworthy actions. He watches them happily chew delicious treats chosen by another. Dogs, they're so smart and multifaceted. As he looks at each one while he waits for the meat to thaw, he thinks about how they're utterly unique in appearance. Even Snowball, Cotton, and Silky are easy to tell apart. He has learned they each have different dispositions and personalities, that they are helpers, that they are confidants. He has seen how sensitive and loyal they are to their brethren and humans alike. As each dog, each who was specifically bred and raised to kill, destroy, or reproduce, as he watches each dog gently take the proffered treat from his hand, he can't help but think that the world is upside down. The world is deaf and blind to all that is good and life-affirming. How does this happen, and why is it so prevalent? When the microwave dings, he turns to fetch a cast-iron skillet from a well-organized drawer. He places it on one of the eyes of the clean gas range. The fire comes to life immediately. When the skillet is hot, he places the thick slab of beef on it and is rewarded with sizzling sounds of cooking. Once the meat is brown and crusty on both sides, he slices it into small, bite-sized pieces. He looks back at Ruger and sees no reaction. He mutters to himself, A dog mourning the loss of his human so deeply he was starving himself to death. Gerald stirs the meat around in the skillet until it's well coated with the liquid fat. He turns off the range, moves the skillet to a cold eye. He turns around to look at Ruger. No movement. The other dogs, satiated by the unaccustomed bounty of treats at the irregular hour, are dozing on the floor, elevated beds, and furniture. Gerald looks at the relaxed scene before him and to his astonishment says out loud, I wouldn't have it any other way. The truth of the surprise utterance sits well in his newly awakening spirit. When the meat has cooled enough to touch, he takes one of the larger pieces, dips it in the juices, and then gently rubs the moist meat around the edges of Ruger's mouth. Then, morsel of meat in hand, he stands up and waits. He hopes that what he learned about Ruger's appetite while he was lying in the hospital bed serves him well now. He remembers the incredible appetite he has, how it seemed that Ruger was always ready to eat. He waits. His wait is rewarded by the sight of the tip of Ruger's tongue moving out and around his mouth to lick away the appetizing moisture on it. When his tongue flicks out again, Gerald quickly puts the morsel of meat on it and is gratified to see Ruger take the food and swallow it. 
He grabs the skillet from the stove and puts it on the ceramic tile floor near Ruger. He sits on the floor and for an hour slowly feeds the depressed dog the food he needs to survive. Gerald is awakened at 7 o'clock one morning by a wet tongue on his mouth and the smell of puppy breath in his nostrils. In the four weeks since he has returned, much has changed in his life his schedule being one of the many vast changes. Gone are the days of staying up all night and sleeping until noon or beyond. His new schedule, or rather, his schedule according to the dogs, is up at 6.30 or 7 and to bed by 10 or before, though some nights he can't sleep due to discomfort. He hasn't seen or heard from Tiny. He has felt her, though. She's somewhere working hard, he feels her deep, exhausted sleep in the evenings and the long hours of industry during the day. He wishes she could feel what he feels, see what he sees, and know what he knows. Every day is a revelation. That's what love is. He knows that now. There's no bottom to love, and one can never get enough of it. He has enthusiastically embraced the responsibility of caring for Tiny's family. He has admitted to himself and accepted that the dogs are hers. He's trying to take care of them for her like she took care of them. He recognizes that she took care of them not for him, but for them, because they are living, breathing, thinking, feeling, sensing creatures who deserve care and attention. Man, has he come a long way. Every single day he's humbled by their total forgiveness of him. It's as though they only remember who he is right now. It has taken longer for Ruger to come around. Emmett tried to remain standoffish, but it went against the grain of his personality. He's a happy-go-lucky, loving fellow, and affection is the bread of his life. Gerald is learning patience from Ruger. Ruger is also teaching him how to be kind, sincerely kind. This morning, he's deep within the acreage of his forest. Everyone is with him, and everyone can keep up. While Gerald is recovering and becoming stronger each day, he still can't stand on his feet for hours a day. Even Petal, the most easily fatigued, comes on these relaxed walks and enjoys it. The heartbreak and shock of Tiny's leaving continues to wear on Ruger. He'll run, sniff, and act interested in all that's around him, but Gerald knows that what he's doing is seeking the presence, the smell of Tiny. He still doesn't come too close to Gerald. He sleeps in Tiny's room on her bed, and Emmett and Day, Petal's male clone, will sleep there with him most nights. Ruger is eating, not as much as he used to, but he's eating. Gerald doesn't doubt that Tiny will return, and when she does, he wants her to know that he took excellent care of her family. He'd had no idea what or how to feed them. He found the food and treats but was so ignorant he didn't know which was which. Online research solved that dilemma and many others. As he waits for Tiny's return, he learns as much as he can about companion animals. Initially, he did it because he had to, though soon he does it because he wants to. The more he researches and reads about dogs, the more he wants to know. And then, because when he's not with them or watching them, verifying the research, he finds himself fascinated by the subject and the subject matter. Though Gerald may be changing and continuing to change in some ways, his mind is as it was before, alive and interested and most at ease when it's fully engaged in learning or figuring something out. He learned that companion animals need exercise. He knows his body does as well if complete healing is to be achieved. Thus, Long walks two times a day with the young begin to take place, and then, also twice daily, he takes short, intellectually engaging walks with the elders. His reading has revealed that dogs need mental stimulation, just like humans, and after seeing the behavior of Ruger, he will not doubt the intelligence of dogs ever again, and Ruger is the least intelligent of them all. For the girls he used as breeding machines, he has devised short trails that push them both physically and mentally. Petal is the brightest and most gung-ho of the lady team, as he calls them. She thinks she can go on long walks, but one trial and her wheezing had convinced him she couldn't and shouldn't. 
he felt her enthusiasm at the same time he felt the stress of the exertions on her joints muscles and lungs he knows a major cause of her inability to walk and run as much as she wants to is because he kept her on a six-foot chain from the day he got her when she was seven weeks old until now her age of eleven he acknowledges himself as her jailer and the author of her enslavement some days when she looks up at him with her tail wagging her tongue lolling out of her mouth and her bright eyes gazing into his with adoration and trust he must look away from her as the flesh crawling shame engulfs his body and mind he didn't know that companion animals thrive on affection human attention and touch he feels the pleasure and delight every time pedal and all of the females he mistreated see him he doesn't know if it's because they sense the drastic change in him or if because they've been free to roam for a good while or because they know freedom and true care her genuine and unflagging interest in him is confounding pedal wants to be with him all the time he finds himself reaching down to pet her more and more often she has wrapped him around her paw and he'd have it no other way who would have thought he could be endlessly fascinated by the maturation and behavior of petal's last litter he wishes tiny could know that he'll have her spade and will do the same for her puppies when they reach the right age he wishes tiny knew that petal and her offspring are being cared for in a proper manner that he would never chain them again or make them live outside when they don't want to most of all he wishes he knew where tiny was he wishes he knew her exact geographic location he can feel her fatigue her anxiety and her loneliness he knows she cries every night as she falls asleep because she desperately misses her family at times he can feel her embarrassment he wonders what that could possibly be about then realizes someone must have asked her to read something then her embarrassment becomes his shame his shame then forces him to remember how he treated her what he made her do so that he could have some pocket money how is it possible that a person once so despicable can then somehow not be despised that's what his grandmother called him when no one else could hear gerald the despised gerald whom nobody cared about gerald the little boy who was born to be despised but that was all a lie right now the last thing he feels is despised he feels wanted and treasured he thinks he'd feel this even if there weren't eleven dogs showing him kindness attention and affection every day he believes that the love that tiny has inside her that is now a mere seedling inside him this love is there whether or not any one or any companion animal is around to physically demonstrate it this mysterious and endlessly generous thing called love is available and in never-ending supply to anyone who will accept it and it doesn't come from humans or dogs it comes from somewhere else he doesn't know where only that the supplier is bigger and more powerful than any gun or rapacious mob or evil when a person can acknowledge love and accept it it will erase confusion and illuminate the world he knows he must go to the facility to give the remains of the slaughtered innocents a proper burial today is the first day he feels he possesses the necessary physical and mental strength to complete the gruesome task he leaves the gate open and is not surprised to see that no one follows him no one passes past the gate not even ruger even the dogs know it's a place unfit for the living and especially unfit for the pure of spirit he doesn't beat himself up any more gerald has accepted that he has changed he's embracing it to live in the past in a constant state of beating himself up serves no purpose what's done is done it was awful what he did he has the rest of his life to make it right He's determined to do just that. He hesitates when he comes to the door. He looks back and sees Ruger and Emmett and Day are sitting on the porch watching him. The rest of the dogs are lying on the ground just inside the fence line. The scene and silent support fortify him. He turns back to the door, opens it, and steps inside. 
He looks along the back wall where he expects to find the rotting corpses of all the animals he had a direct hand in slaughtering. The metal nooses are empty. The bodies are gone. All that remains is dried blood and hair on the wall and in rough circles at the base of each spot. He looks toward the ring where he forced Ruger to kill. He looks at the ring where he endured his torment. A wave of deep emotion overcomes him, causing him to stagger. He puts his hand on the wall for support. The moment he touches the wall, all of the death and destruction of that day washes over him. It's not as intense or as crippling as it was, but again he feels the pain and confusion of the companion animals who were robbed of life and love on that day and unconscionably sacrificed for the greed and base desires of man. Thank you for listening to part three of Some Old White Woman, Some Old Black Dude. This has been Dog Food with Catherine Abel. Until next time.